Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 13, How Email Works. In this lesson, we are going to examine two illustrations that help us to understand how computers send, store, and receive emails. Some of you may be watching these videos for a course that uses this textbook. The illustrations that we're going to look at in this video are both from Chapter 4. Now, if you aren't using this textbook, don't worry about it. Just follow along with the video. To begin, let's examine an illustration that summarizes the basic parts of an email system. For now, let's pretend that an email message is moving from left to right. The sender is the user on the left, and the recipient is the user on the right. To help us to talk about these users, let's give them names. I'll call the user on the left Jack, and the one on the right Jill. Jack will begin by writing and addressing the email using what is called a user agent. In Jack's case, his user agent is an email application that lives on his own computer. Examples of such applications include Microsoft Outlook or Mozilla's open source Thunderbird email application. These applications are compatible with private email systems, like the one that Jack uses. What exactly is a private email system? Well, most people don't use private email systems for their personal emails anymore, so you may not be familiar with private email systems. Most of us are probably more familiar with web-based user agents attached to web-based email services. Examples of web-based user agents include Gmail, Hotmail, and Yahoo Mail. However, some people prefer private email services that can only be accessed from private user agent applications. Many businesses and workplaces will use private systems like these. For private email systems, users must have an email application like Outlook or Thunderbird installed on their computer in order to access their private emails. A private email system also means that Jack's emails are stored on Jack's private network. In fact, he may just store them right on his computer. If we look over to the right side of the illustration, we see that Jill has a web-based user agent. A web-based user agent stores Jill's emails out on the web somewhere. It also means that Jill can send and receive emails from any computer with an internet connection. Jack can only send and receive emails from within his private network, which contains a very limited number of computers. In fact, if it's a home network, Jack may only have one computer connected to it. So Jack writes an email, and then he sends it off through the internet. Jack's email must travel from his private email system through a series of servers called Message Transfer Agents, or MTAs, before it can reach its destination over on Jill at the right side of the page. Jack composes his message in his user agent, and then when he hits send, the user agent sends the email to the first message transfer agent. That message transfer agent sends the email to another message transfer agent, which sends it through the internet to a third message transfer agent. The final message transfer agent would store the message until Jill's web-based user agent requested access to new incoming emails. This user agent accesses the email for Jill, but since the user agent is web-based, the information has to travel through a completely different internet path between the user agent and Jill's computer. If Jill wanted to send a message back to Jack, the whole process would be reversed. Jill would write a message in her user agent, which appears in her web browser. When she hits send, the email would travel through the internet to her web-based email client. This email client would forward the email to a message transfer agent. The message would travel across the internet through various message transfer agents, and the final message transfer agent would keep the email in storage until Jack's user agent requested access to new incoming emails. In this illustration, you can see that the connections between message transfer agents are labeled SMTP. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which is the communications protocol that message transfer agents use to communicate with each other. You might think of SMTP as the language of email servers, kind of like how internet protocol is the language of the internet. Let's examine one more illustration that shows how email systems work. This one shows many of the same things that we just saw in the first illustration, but it highlights some different details. 
In this illustration, we see a user, Alice, sending a message to another user, Bob. Her message is composed of a short text message that says, Hi, Bob, and then there's a picture of a palm tree. Alice sends this email using her user agent, which relays the message to a message transfer agent. The message transfer agent sends the email across the internet to a second message transfer agent. This second message transfer agent holds the email for Bob until his user agent downloads all of his new incoming emails. Bob can view the email through his user agent. This illustration helps to show us how email addressing works. When Alice addresses this email, she specifies that it should go to bob at dougj.net. Well, where exactly is dougj.net? It turns out that everything following the at in an email address is the name of a specific message transfer agent somewhere on the internet. So, in a non-technical sense, the email system asks Alice, which message transfer agent do you want me to send this email to? Alice responds, the one for dougj.net. And then the email system asks, okay, now which user at the message transfer agent do you want me to deliver this email to once it gets there? And Alice responds, send it to Bob. The email address tells the computer, send this email to the username Bob at the mail server called dougj.net. Now, every email keeps an official record of what it is and where it's been. When Alice first composes the email, all it contains is a message and an address. However, once she hits send, her user agent will attach a header that gives the recipient more information. It will add a return address, which shows the recipient who the email came from. It will also add something called a MIME header. MIME stands for Multipurpose Internet Mail Extension. It turns out that when email protocols were first designed, they were only designed to handle plain text messages. However, MIME allows email systems to work around this limitation. The MIME header allows emails to carry different design elements that go beyond plain text, elements such as images, special fonts, and file attachments. The MIME header on an email will explain what the email contains. In this case, it will say that Alice's email contains text and an image. When the message goes to the first message transfer agent, that message transfer agent leaves a header of its own so that there's a record of where the email has been. All subsequent message transfer agents will leave headers of their own as well. In this illustration, there are only two message transfer agents, and so the email only picks up two message transfer agent headers. The email arrives at Bob's user agent with all of these headers attached. In many cases, the headers will end up being much longer than the email message itself. To reduce clutter, most modern user agents won't display all of these headers, at least not by default. In Bob's case, he can only see the message and a reduced header that tells him who sent it. However, user agents will allow you to see the full header if you ask for it. You could try this with one of your own emails. To view one of these full headers in your user agent, open an email and look for an option that says something like view full header or display message details or something like that. Normally, you wouldn't have much reason to be interested in these headers. That's why most modern user agents hide them. But sometimes they are useful. For example, it is useful that a header keeps a record of where an email has been. Sometimes, cyber criminals will send forged emails that pretend to come from a trusted source, say your workplace or your grandma. But if you learn to read email headers, you can check for yourself which message transfer agents the email originated from. Cyber criminals can fake the return address on an email, but they cannot fake the message transfer agent headers. If you receive a suspicious email that claims to be from your grandma, it's possible to check the detailed header of the email to determine whether it really came from the same message transfer agent as your grandma's other emails. Okay, that's all for now about email systems. Of course, there is much more to learn about how email works, but if you followed along with this lecture, then you probably already know more than most casual users do. In the next video, we'll talk about security threats that come through email, and we'll identify some ways to avoid, or at least to minimize, these threats.
Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 14, Email Security. In this lecture, we'll touch on six common email threats. Eavesdropping, spamming and phishing, spoofing, malicious email attachments, replying and forwarding issues, and carbon copy and blind carbon copy issues. Email threat number one is eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is when other people observe your internet traffic without you knowing it. There are two primary eavesdropping threats. The first is the threat of somebody eavesdropping by simply observing you without your knowing it. Sometimes people will just look over your shoulder and watch what you're doing. They could observe things like your passwords, or they could read your emails if they're open on your screen. Another kind of eavesdropping is called sniffing. Sniffing is when an eavesdropper uses a computer to intercept the radio signals traveling between your computer and wireless router. They might intercept your username and password when you log into your email account, and they might intercept the emails themselves as they're sent to and from your web browser for your viewing. If your email service encrypts your email traffic, then that will help to protect you from sniffing and many web-based email services do encrypt email traffic. But if your email traffic is unencrypted, then sniffing can be a serious threat. Email threat number two is spamming and phishing. Sending emails is cheap. For most of us, all it costs is our time, and it costs about the same amount of time to send an email to 10 people as it does to send an email to 10,000 people, assuming you have that many people on your contacts list. That's why email has become the communication of choice for many advertisers and scammers. They can send a tremendously high volume of messages at almost no cost. The costs are so low that even if only a tiny fraction of the recipients respond, then those responses can pay off. Spam is a kind of advertising email. Spam is usually unsolicited, that is, you never asked anybody to send it to you. And it's normally junk mail that simply wastes your time. Spam is more of a nuisance than a security threat. Phishing emails, on the other hand, are a security threat. Here's an example of a real phishing email that showed up in my inbox. Phishing emails look like an email from a legitimate entity, such as a bank or a social network. However, phishing emails are sent out by scammers who are trying to get you to give them private information, usually usernames and passwords. This one is supposed to look like it came from a real bank, Chase. But I don't bank at Chase. This email is just trying to direct me to a fake banking webpage that is designed to trick me into sharing my banking information. In a lot of cases, phishing emails are sent out as mass emails to hundreds or thousands of email addresses at a time. The scammers can send all of these emails for cheap, and they'll make a profit if only one or two recipients fall for the trick. Email threat number three is spoofing. With emails, it's possible to fake a return address. It's similar to a paper letter, actually. Have you ever sent a letter through the postal service but forgot to put a return address on it? Or have you sent a letter but accidentally put the wrong return address on it? Chances are that the letter probably still reached its destination. The postal service doesn't need a return address to deliver a letter. They don't even look at the return address unless they're unable to deliver the letter for some reason. Just like the postal service, email services don't need an accurate return address to deliver a message. You can send an email from one account, but say that you're sending it from another account. And the system will usually deliver the email to the correct recipient anyway. Email systems don't usually need to know the sender's address, they just need the recipient's address. Some scanners use this feature for a scam tactic called spoofing. A spoofed email is one that says it's from one person, but actually came from somebody else. On a spoofed email, the return address is just a fake. Phishing scammers and other cyber criminals sometimes spoof their emails. They will say that an email comes from a trusted person or a trusted institution, even though it really didn't. Now, the key to telling a spoofed email from a legitimate email is the email header. Do you remember in Lesson 13 when we talked about the full header that comes along with each email? 
the full header tells us where an email really came from. A savvy email user who learns to read the full header of an email can use the information in the header to tell the difference between a spoofed email and a genuine email. Email threat number four is malicious email attachments. As you probably already know, you can use emails to send file attachments to other people. These files could be documents, images, or even software programs. Cybercriminals take advantage of this functionality by using emails to deliver malicious software straight to a user's computer. One common method is to send an intriguing email that encourages the user to open the attachment out of curiosity. For example, check out this phony order confirmation email. I'll stop talking for a moment to give you a chance to pause the video and read the email if you like. Can you see how this email is intended to confuse the recipient? If you got this email but hadn't made a purchase that corresponds to this confirmation order, then you might wonder what's going on and who should you contact to sort out the problem. In a state of confusion, a recipient might open the attachment hoping that it would shed some much needed light on the situation. But this attachment will just make everything worse. This attachment is a .exe file, which means that it will automatically run some program when you open it. When the file runs, it's sure to install malicious software right onto your computer. Email threat number five is replying and forwarding. The reply button and the forward button are helpful email tools. Neither is associated with any direct security risks per se, but they do involve some privacy issues that are worth mentioning. You should remember that the reply and forward buttons make emails really, really easy to share, even on accident sometimes. Before you do something silly like send passwords or embarrassing photos through email, consider how easy it is for the recipient to share that information with everybody in his or her address book. Don't hit send unless you really, really mean it. And be especially careful about what you send to your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It's sad and it's unfortunate, but a lot of people send sensitive information to a boyfriend or a girlfriend only to have the information forwarded to hundreds of other people after a nasty breakup. Because forwarding takes so little effort, it only takes a passing moment of weakness, anger, or bad judgment for somebody to forward sensitive information to practically everybody they know. So remember that even if you trust somebody now, you may not be able to trust him or her forever. In many cases, trust is temporary, but the forward button is forever. Furthermore, you would be wise to remember the distinction between the reply button in an email system and the reply all button. Reply automatically addresses your response email to one address, the address that sent you the email in the first place. Reply all automatically addresses your response to everybody who received the email. Many email users have embarrassed themselves by accidentally hitting reply all and thereby sending a sensitive message to a large group of people rather than just sending it to one specific person. Email threat number six are the two carbon copy and blind carbon copy functions. Okay, this one is not technically a threat, but it's still a good idea to cover the difference between the to field, the carbon copy or CC field, and the blind carbon copy or BCC field in an email address bar. Most of you have probably used the to field before. That's where you type the address of a person to whom you want to send an email. Simple enough, to sends email to people, easy peasy. Many of you have probably also used the carbon copy or CC field before. If you have, you know that your email user agent will also send an email to any address listed in the CC field. So what's the difference between to and carbon copy? Well, they function almost exactly the same. The only real difference is that the carbon copy field is intended for recipients other than the primary recipient. For example, imagine that you're working on a group project in a class, and imagine that your instructor has asked you to submit the project via email. On the day that you submit the project, you might write an email to the teacher and attach your project to the email. 
and then you might decide to include all of your partner's email addresses in the carbon copy field. That way, they'll get the email, and they can see that you submitted the project on time. When they receive the email, they will see that they're in the CC field instead of the To field, and they will know immediately that they are not intended to be the primary recipients of the email. They can then read or not read the email accordingly, from the mindset of a non-primary recipient. Some of you may have used the blind carbon copy or BCC field before, but I suspect that this field is unfamiliar to some of you. Blind carbon copy works just like carbon copy. It sends the email to non-primary recipients, but with one important difference. Blind carbon copy keeps these extra recipients a secret. When you CC people on an email, everybody who receives that email can see who has been CC'd on it. When you list addresses in the blind carbon copy field of an email, only the sender and the BCC'd receiver can see who is BCC'd in the email. So imagine that you're planning a surprise birthday party for a friend. You decide that you're going to take her out for bowling and then surprise her by having 10 of her friends waiting for her at the bowling alley. The day of the event, you might send her a confirmation to make sure that she's going to come out for the party. And you could list all of the surprise guests in the blind carbon copy field of the email. This way, everybody receives the confirmation email, but the primary recipient can't see that there are surprise guests who also received the confirmation. Blind carbon copy allows you to send the same email to multiple people, but it also gives you better control over who can and cannot see who else received the email. Okay, that's all for now about email security. In this lesson, we covered six email threats. Eavesdropping, spamming and phishing, spoofing, malicious email attachments, replying and forwarding issues, and carbon copy and blind carbon copy issues. In the next lesson, we're going to start learning about malicious software, or malware. Computer viruses are one example of malware, but as you're about to see, Viruses aren't the only kind of malware that can infect your computer.